Hey everybody, welcome to 21st Century HR live broadcast on LinkedIn. Uh, very excited to be bringing these to you today. Uh, for those of you that are watching your first LinkedIn live broadcast, I think this is about my third broadcast, so we're all figuring this out together. But uh, really excited about the promise and the potential of this platform. And uh, a couple of housekeeping items kind of as we're getting ready to get started. One, uh, there's about a 40 second delay in what I'm broadcasting and what you're actually seeing and hearing. So why that matters is from a comment standpoint. So this is going to be an AMA. I'm going to want you to give me your questions and comments that you have uh, in the comment section on this post. Um, I'm going to do my best to get all those answered, uh, but just know there is a bit of a delay. So if I'm not jumping on that right away, now you know why. So anyway, what I wanted to do is really start, before we get into the AMA, I wanted to just give a little bit of background and context on the Employer Branding for Dummies book and where that came from and kind of what that process of development was like, just to give you a little bit of context heading into the AMA. So um, Employer Branding for Dummies was something that I wrote with Richard Mosley. We co-authored the book uh, and it was really designed to be a, a foundational guide for how to do employer branding. So Richard, um, I was on the advisory board of Universum. Uh, Richard leads employer branding for them. And so when he approached me to come in with him and write the book, you know, I jumped at the chance because Richard's somebody that uh, I think he's, you know, I view him as one of the godfathers of employer branding, uh, brings a, a wealth of experience, probably more so than almost anybody in this space. And so the opportunity to collaborate with him on a book um, I knew would be a very uh, interesting experience. And uh, also I'd never written a book. And also I was, uh, I viewed myself as a marginal writer. So I knew that uh, whatever that process was going to be like, I'd come out uh, out of a better uh, writer and, and I'd learn a lot from working with him. And so when we collaborated, we really broke the book down into a couple sections. You know, he focused a bit more on the kind of foundational elements of building an employer brand, building an EVP, um, setting the strategic direction of an employer brand strategy. Um, I focused more on the, the execution of that. So when you have that in place, how are you actually taking that to the market? How are you developing internal brand advocates? How are you doing all the things internally that you need to build a compelling employer brand? And so uh, it was a very interesting process to write. You know, I don't know how many of you watching this um, are writers or bloggers. I, I was a blogger before that. Uh, this is certainly my first time going through the, the editorial process of writing a book. Uh, Richard had written, I think, three by the time we got to this. So he was a uh, he was a seasoned veteran. I think for me, uh, it was a really interesting experience because I, when I got pulled in, we had a pretty condensed timeline. So I had about uh, six weeks to write uh, my whole section. And literally, I, I had to block my calendar. I mean, I was, I was from sun up to sundown, writing, researching, studying, uh, uh, all the things that go into that. And then the interesting thing about a dummies book, and you know, again, from Richard, who's written uh, non-dummies books to writing this book, uh, he said this is one of the more difficult books to write as well because the way that, uh, that those books are actually developed is the, the content has to be incredibly prescriptive. And, and the idea is the audience can be anybody from entry-level people who you know, are kind of learning about the field for the first time through that book to seasoned people that are maybe just fine-tuning elements um, of their practice. And so you, you have to write a book that speaks to a broad spectrum of readers and uh, and that's not easy and the way that uh, Wiley works is you actually uh, you don't have an editor you have a dumbifier that's the actual title of the person who you work with and it's their job to essentially you know go through and work with you and 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 break down your content in a way that makes it um, you know readily makes it a prescriptive and readily available for mass consumption and um, that is not an easy task um, but uh, I think it made us end up developing a book that's really uh, relatable and easy to connect with. And again, this stream isn't about pitching the book. I, I have copies of the book I can, uh, I can hook people up with. Uh, it's more of just giving you, I wanted to give some context as to kind of how that, what that process looked like um, before actually getting into the meat of the AMA. So um, for those of you that haven't participated in AMAs, AMA stands for Ask Me Anything. Uh, and uh, yes, it's related to employer brand. I guess if it's going to be AMA, it could be anything, so ask anything. But uh, I imagine a lot of the questions will center around employer brand. Uh, the way LinkedIn is live is set up is, uh, you can't see this now, but I'm broadcasting to you on a iPad using a tool called Switcher Studio. 
Um, behind that, I have dual screens uh, in my setup, and on that I have my LinkedIn profile, which has the comment. So uh, if it looks like I'm looking at you and I'm looking off a little bit, getting into the questions, um, that's how I'm actually getting a comment so I can come back and engage with you. So don't worry, I'm paying attention to you, but this is how I end up doing that. So if you have questions, uh, go ahead and leave them in the comments. I'm gonna go ahead and jump uh, in this quickly and see if we have any that are started off. But um, what I wanted to kind of cover, there's a couple topics that, um, two topics in particular, questions that I get asked a lot as it relates to employer brand. And I wanna start with those before getting into uh, your questions. One is around an employer value proposition, you know, or EVP. And a lot of people, uh, there's varied camps on the role an EV play, an EVP plays in an employer brand strategy. Um, there's a lot of people out there that think it's a foundational element and you absolutely have to start with that because everything connects back to that, that your EVP is really the, the nucleus of your employer branding efforts. Uh, and there's other people that think that it is, uh, it's not as important and you can begin executing with kind of a directional sense of what those things are. Um, you know, honestly, I've worked in both. I've worked in organizations that have wanted to develop a core EVP and start with that as a foundation. I've worked with companies that said, look, no, we just want to execute. We want to start kind of going to the market with some of these uh, approaches and, and help us kind of target and recruit candidates. And so I think you can go either way with that. Um, uh, if you are developing an EVP, there's lots of great guidance in there around it that you can help you actually develop that. Um, you know, the book for one, but uh, there's groups on Facebook, there's the Talent Brand Alliance, there's Employer Branding Forum uh, on Facebook. Uh, a quick Google search will give you a wealth of information on how to develop an EVP. Um, but I would say, you know, that it's recommended, I think it's helpful, but I don't think it's essential. And another topic that we hear a lot about right now in employer branding is personas. And I think persona development um, really does drive a level of sophistication to an employer brand strategy. And when you think about personas, for those of you that aren't familiar with them, this is really taking a page out of marketing's playbook where you know, marketing will get very specific in developing what their target consumer is, what their target customer is, who's gonna be buying their products or services. Uh, and then they can, once they have that profile identified, they understand your interests, your wants, your habits, what things you read, what websites you visit. Uh, and they can really develop a targeted strategy on how they're gonna get that content to you to compel you to buy their products. Um, take that into the sphere of employer brand, it works very much the same way. So rather than having a one size fits all uh, employer brand or recruitment marketing strategy where you're trying to say, uh, you know, this is th these are the value drivers that we're just gonna blast out to everybody and, and hope that connects with people. Um, personas allow you to say, you know, if we're hiring developers in London, this is how we need to talk about the work experience. If we're hiring product managers in South Africa, this is how we have to talk about it. And obviously it's gonna be different. Um, I think personas are great. I think they are an important, important element to employer branding. But I also think they're a fairly sophisticated element of employer branding. And for a lot of you out there, you're probably working in a team of one and it's just you. And that might not even be your full focus. You might be uh, a recruiter who's also been tasked with doing employer brand. Um, the idea that you have the capacity and the cycles to get that sophisticated, I think is probably a bit unrealistic. So while I definitely, uh, as, a, as a concept within employer branding and as a uh, a, a kind of a method with an employer branding. I think personas are very valuable, but I think it also depends on where you are in your kind of uh, evolution within your team and within your kind of sophistication. Not even sophisticated, it's more of what, what are the resources you have? Do you have the capacity to really develop, um, you know, A, the personas, but then B, the targeted and relevant content that's going to speak directly to those personas. And um, I think without the capacity to do that, personas are nice to have, but um, there's probably other things you can be investing your time on that are going to be uh, a little higher dividend and uh, higher payoff for you. So those are two questions I wanted to start with because those are questions that I do get asked a lot. So I'm going to jump over to the comments now and see if we can bring those in. So again, if you have any comments, um, just leave them in the comment section here and uh, I'm going to jump right into these. So. Uh, this is you watching me scrolling through a feed on another screen, which is incredibly compelling. Um, first question from my buddy, Matt Chardy. Matt, why are we doing this? Why does this exist? Uh, you know, 
I can't tell you from LinkedIn's perspective, but I'll tell you from my perspective. I think live is something, obviously, it's been around for a while. We've played around with it quite a bit. Um, for me, I think the, the interest in LinkedIn versus Facebook, and this is probably not a, a true question, I'll have to answer it anyway, uh, is in Facebook or Twitter or whatever platform like that, we've got, you know, at least for me, I've got a network of uh, industry friends and I've got a lot of friends that uh, don't really give a damn about recruiting or any of this stuff. And so, you know, when we had tools like Facebook Live, I think we would always broadcast there because that's what we had. I think uh, LinkedIn is a much more targeted audience. Uh, and so for me, um, still early days here, but I'm excited about the potential of uh, being able to do shows like this, but also really being able to go live uh, to events and conferences and do live interviews like I did last week with um, Chris White in San Diego. So um, we'll see. I think, uh, again, early days, but I think there's a lot of potential, particularly I know uh, Jamie Leonard is on here. Uh, I know you're looking at uh, using LinkedIn Live at RecFest. I think the ability to you know, live stream industry content to a very targeted audience that you know is interested in that, you know, that space, um, I think can be really powerful and it, it ultimately gives people, more people access to that content, those speakers, um, and uh, I think that's, uh, that's helpful. So we'll see over time uh, where this goes, um, but uh, I'm definitely intrigued by the potential of it. So uh, we are gonna jump back down. So uh, Ruchi, I think you had a question on which software. Um, so for this streaming, uh, I'm using Switcher Studio. So uh, when LinkedIn went live, there was three live broadcast tools that they have um, agreements with. Switcher is one of them. Um, I like Switcher because I'm an Apple guy and it's all iOS. So um, the, the flexibility of the platform is pretty incredible. So right now I'm broadcasting on an iPad Pro. Um, what you can do with Switcher is you can actually connect up to eight iOS devices to do multi-camera, multi-angle shots. So it's basically a portable studio. Uh, that you can bring with you. Uh, will I ever do a broadcast with eight iPhones? I don't think so, but uh, I think especially for Jamie and other people that produce live events, when you have the ability to actually toggle between cameras and angles and even stages, uh, I think that gets pretty powerful. So um, offhand, I don't remember the other two. There's two other platforms that uh, uh, certainly a lot of people use, but uh, I found Switcher to be the most intuitive and uh, the learning curve isn't that bad. I think within about a day, um, I had an idea of kind of how to set this up. So. Um, Jamie, question, what free tools are out there for companies with zero budget for employer brand? You know, fortunately there's a lot. I think when you look at uh, the discipline of employer branding, a lot of that comes back to sharing your work. And obviously if you're creating campaigns and programs initiatives, uh, you want candidates to see them. Clearly they're aimed at candidates for the most part. Um, but I think what I found, and this is one of the things that I really liked about the employer brand community is because uh, a lot of the work that was being done there, especially if you back up to around 2010, 2011 and take it forward, um, a lot of companies were doing things for the first time. Um, there wasn't a, a playbook. There wasn't a, a clear guideline around um, how to do things, how to measure things, what tools to use. And so, uh, you know, I found the community was, was great about kind of sharing how they did what they did and what they were learning. And so, um, you know, a simple Google search will yield a lot of things. For me, um, you know, obviously I'm a co-founder of HR Open Source, so clearly I'm biased, but the majority of our case studies in HR Open Source are actually employer brand case studies. So, uh, and all of those break down um, specifically from companies like Cisco and Dell and Hootsuite, um, you know, what the company did, how they did it, and how really being, you know, meaty enough that it's, it's prescriptive, it essentially gives you the playbook for exactly how they did it. Um, what the results were, so it includes ROI, um, what the, the stumbling blocks were and kind of where they messed up. So every company has to actually conclude if we did this thing, here's where we screwed up. And the idea behind that, you know, A, it's partly humility, but it's also saying, hey, look, if you're using this as a blueprint to try to do this or something similar, look out for X or look out for Y. This might blow up in your face. So these are things that you want to think about if you're going to execute this kind of initiative. So. Um, I think that's really helpful. And then I mentioned earlier on Facebook, um, there's two really good uh, platforms and, uh, and groups. Uh, one is the Employer Brand Forum. The other is the Talent Brand Alliance. Uh, and again, all of those resources are free. So no barriers, no friction uh, to get in a lot of really high value content there. 
Um, so, Bobby, question around uh, rolling out a global EVP um, where you've got multiple countries. And I think that's a great question. If you're a multinational, certainly it's something that you are uh, chat tasked with and challenged with. What I generally recommend in situations like that is you have, uh, you have a core EVP, what I call the, the umbrella EVP. This is uh, something that should really cut across all of your functions and regions uh, and, and feel somewhat relatable to all of your employees no matter where they're based. Um, oftentimes EVPs are part reality, part aspirational. Most EVPs have an aspirational element to them. That's okay as long as they're not you know, weighted so far towards aspirational that employees aren't gonna recognize them. Uh, so I think that's really important. I think once you have that EVP, that umbrella EVP established, then you need to develop you know, individual value propositions. And I don't mean individual to the, the employee level, but individual to the, um, the country, the region, the function, um, in some cases, the, the seniority, right? If you have different tiers of roles, um, that's more targeted to, it still aligns to the umbrella EVP, that top level EVP, um, but it's more kind of nuanced as it relates to that population. I think that's really important for multinational companies, particularly for those of you uh, that work for companies that are based in the US and have global operations. Because I think especially in the early days of employer branding, what you found a lot is that um, you know, usually their employer brand teams were based in the US. They were centralized here. And so they would create a locally relevant EVP that probably you know, queried employees locally and then tried rolling that out globally and saying, you know, here's your EVP. And meanwhile, you've got employees in Indonesia or uh, Bangkok or you know, Melbourne or wherever saying, well, wait a minute, this, that's not my reality. Um, that's not, that doesn't resonate with me and, and actually it creates resentment. So I think it's really important that you have that overarching uh, top level employer brand kind of umbrella employer EVP and then you have uh, localized versions beneath that that connect more and speak to the local experience uh, in the different markets where you're recruiting. Uh, next question is coming here from Ben Martinez. Your best model slash approach for creating a talent persona for a company. Yeah, I think for me, uh, what I would generally recommend is, you know, you're hiring, uh, you're struggling hiring software engineers. You want to create a persona around your ideal software engineer so that you can bring more of those people into the organization. Go sit down and talk to your software engineers. Uh, you know, create, and there's lots of, uh, uh, of great templates out there. Universum has some templates you can Google. PH Creative has some templates you can Google. Um, but find some of the publicly available templates on persona development, localize that based on how you're going to use it, and then sit down with your team. Sit down with your people in those roles you're trying to recruit. Figure out like what websites do you go to? Where do you go for news? Uh, what, what information resonates with you? What things do you get excited about? Uh, and I think that will really help you kind of build a, a locally relevant persona based on, on real employees that you want to you know, kind of replicate or emulate in future hires. So. Um, straightforward, but again, take people to coffee, sit down with them, talk to them about it. Um, but in terms of the template themselves, you can get those all over the internet. But uh, Universum and PH Creative both have good ones that you can Google and, and download for free. Uh, all right, so next question is from uh, Matt Archer. Uh, do companies segment their employer branding by the various candidate departments, targeting multiple personas, for instance? Um, they should. I think in an ideal state, they should. I think the reality, though, for a lot of companies is uh, if you had a, a thoroughly resourced recruiting and branding team, you'd absolutely do this. Do any of you have that? Right. I think that's the struggle. If you look at a, a, a utopian kind of ideal state that wasn't constrained by realities of, of budgets and, uh, and resources, uh, absolutely. You'd have um, persona-based targeting for all of your different departments to really make sure that you could hone in on the right type of talent. Um, is that the reality for anybody that I know? No. So I think what you end up having to do is to really prioritize any persona-based targeting around the most critical positions you're trying to hire and that you're struggling with um, so that you can really get the most bang for your buck in those geographies or those disciplines uh, as opposed to trying to, to take that strategy and apply it to all of these jobs because you're just going to spread yourself too thin uh, and you're not going to be able to make an impact if you, if you take that approach, I think. Uh, all right, coming down, we've got another question here from uh, Jill Elliott. Uh, looks like, nope, 
That's a statement. Yeah, actually, uh, one more piece here. Obviously, if you have questions, leave them here. If you have answers to other questions that people are asking, uh, go ahead and comment on their post and, and help them out as well. So I'm going to do my best to tackle all the questions that come during this AMA. Um, but, uh, but by all means, uh, I, I see who's commenting. There's a lot of experts out there actually on this thread. So if somebody asks a question you have an answer to, please weigh in. Uh, don't leave all the questions for me. I'll do my best to jump in on them, but uh, you know, share your experience as well. So uh, this next question comes from Ale, uh, Ashley uh, Boudoin, and I, I butchered that. I'm sorry. You're going to have to help me out on pronunciation. Uh, but she asks, uh, what about contingent value proposition? Are employers equipped yet with how to roll out career pages and narratives for contingent value propositions and understanding what values your contingent workforce talent care about and attract them? That's a really good question. I, I would imagine if you are in a sophisticated uh, employer branding organization or a company that has a sophisticated group, you will have. That's part of that that targeted messaging. So your core EVP messaging may not resonate the same way with your contingent workforce. You need to develop a, a, a localized um, EVP to speak to them or an IVP to speak to them because their drivers are different. Um, their, their goals are different. What they're looking for from the work experience is going to be different and how you attract them is going to be different. And so um, I do think it's important to have a targeted approach to that workforce. Um, whether you're able to develop that or not is largely going to be dependent on uh, how well you're resourced as an employer brand function. Um, got another question here from uh, Ronald Marsh. How do you shift the branding to be embraced by HR if there is no history of branding and you are now bridging all the sectors of the business under one brand? Yeah, that's, that's a really good question. I think when you, if, if you look at just the term brand and where that sits, I think that it is, um, it, it, it's complicated, right? So you have marketing and marketing is, uh, has historically for most organizations been the owner of the brand, uh, right? So, um, you know, consumer brand is their domain, uh, advertising, all of that typically is owned by marketing. As you had employer brands starting to come up and mature, um, I, I would venture to guess the vast majority of companies out there, I've certainly experienced this many times in my career, um, there was that, that tension between marketing and employer brand and that, that conflict because uh, here you are in marketing, the, the, the keepers of the brand, the custodians of the brand historically, and now you have uh, employer brand and or recruiting and or HR coming up and saying, no, we want to speak to clients. We want to represent the organization. We want to tell stories. We want to use social media. We want to use video. And, and that is, uh, that's, that's, that was overwhelming, I think, for a lot of marketing departments. And I think especially in the early days before employer branding had reached this level of maturity, there was a lot of pushback um, for marketing. They were like, nope, this is ours. You can't do that. Uh, here, we'll give you a Twitter account, but you have to run all your posts by us, right? Which is just not, you can't, can't do it that way. And so I think that there, there was a real you know, struggle in the early days of employer brand. I think as the field has matured, you know, you're starting to see less of that. I think most people in marketing, um, many of them have worked somewhere that had an employer brand um, you know, focus or at least an element or at least they're familiar with it based on some of the things that their peers are doing or some of the things they're reading. Uh, and so I think that uh, while that tension and that friction does exist in a lot of companies still, I think it, it's lessened a little bit. I think ultimately what you really need to do is to, if you're in this position, right? So I think for meeting your question, uh, you know, you're in an organization that's never had employer brand, you're trying to make the case for it. Uh, you're trying to make the case both within HR and possibly within marketing. Um, what, what the approach that I generally recommend is uh, two things. One, go and see what your competitors are doing and see if they're heavily investing in employer brand and bring some of that intel back to your organization and say, look, you know, you can keep your head in the sand and you can say, we don't need to invest here. But the reality is this is what we're up against. And when we're recruiting talent, we're coming up against these companies and they're armed with X, Y, and Z to help tell their story and, and attract uh, uh, targeted candidates. We're not. So that's, that's an uphill battle for us. And so I think that Competitive pressure can be pretty compelling when you're trying to make a case study internally. I think on the marketing side, you want to really show them that the investing in employer brand can actually have a lift on the consumer brand as well. And I'll give you an example of that. Um, if you look on the HR open source website, it's uh, hros.co, uh, and just there's a big search box right when you get there. Search for Centric, C-E-N-T-R-I-C. Um, Centric was a consulting company 
that uh, contributed a case study to HR Open Source, and it was basically based on uh, it was it was really centered around Glassdoor, but this analogy transcends Glassdoor. Um, they you know the Glassdoor scores were pretty low. They made a concerted effort to to bring those up, and their CEO got involved, and he was responding to reviews, and um, they really made it a focal part of their talent strategy. And he ended up getting you know CEO of the year and their awards, and they jumped up to a 4.5 rating and, and all of that's great. But what was really interesting about that case study is they actually found after the fact that uh, it had a lift on revenue. So what happened, and this is, you know, they're a consulting company. So obviously uh, there's a lot of consulting companies out there. And so where companies were evaluating whether to do business with them or not, Glassdoor was one of the platforms they were going to, to actually gauge the health of the organization and the culture. And, you know, do people like working here? Do people, uh, you know, approve of the CEO? Would people recommend working here? All those things, all those data points that Glassdoor provides. And because they had such a strong presence on Glassdoor, that was an influential data point that actually won them business. So the reality is, uh, you know, consumers and, and potential clients, they're doing their homework on your company. They're trying to see like, what's this place all about? And if they're able to encounter employer brand content that's that's compelling and it and it presents your organization uh, in a way that seems real uh, and and interesting and engaging, that may be a decision point that helps them get to yes. And so um, that certainly drives consumer brand, that drives revenue, and I think that's another point um, that uh, that really helps when you're trying to make the case internally. Uh, I'm going to jump back over to some of the comments here. Uh, Ashley Bowden, thank you for that uh, that correction. I appreciate that. Uh, let's see. How do you find HR's image across all functions with respect to their involvement in organization major objectives? Um, from Sanjay uh, Ponce. I think you know the field of HR. When you talk about the reputation, um, absolutely there is a spectrum, and you're watching a live broadcast called Twenty First Century HR. So you know you know where I land on this. I think that. Um, there's a pretty big delta between you know, best-in-class HR and worst-in-class HR. And if you look, look to this side and best-in-class, um, absolutely uh, the, those functions are respected, they're consulted, um, they're part of all major decisions that impact the organization, uh, and, and you know, the organization wouldn't be what it is without them. Go to the other spectrum, the other side of the spectrum, and it's a very different you know, animal. It's transactional, it's, uh, it's reactive, uh, it's you know bloated in some cases, and in uh, many cases it, it's not respected. And so it, it's hard to give a single answer on that. It really depends on what your experience has been based on uh, the the company and the organization and how they both um, value and resource uh, their HR functions. So um, you know it really depends on where you sit to to what your view might be on that. Um, again, I think that this this leading edge here is still very much the the, the minority, but it's growing. And so one of my aims with this you know, live show and my podcast and uh, you know, my writing and everything I've been working on is to really um, try to highlight examples of great HR and great recruiting and progressive practices and approaches um, to really just shine a light on what's possible and what's actually happening so that uh, you know, other practitioners can kind of see that and say, okay, we need to do more of that or that gives me an idea to do this that's, that's kind of like that. Um, I'll actually have an article coming out on Fast Company tomorrow um, titled, Have We Outgrown the Term Human Resources? And it's basically you know, an exploration of the evolution of the, the title HR and kind of how it evolved from personnel and how it now is evolving into a variety of different things. Uh, but with it, the actual function and the impact and the results uh, are evolving with it. So um, that should be interesting. I'll share that on LinkedIn, obviously, once it goes live. And uh, I would love your feedback there. And, uh, We'll certainly be wearing my uh, my Kevlar for all of you HR purists that uh, that that wonder how dare I challenge the name Human Resources, but uh, but I do. So uh, we're going to jump into a couple more questions here. Is there a difference between talent brand and employer brand? Um, if so, can you explain these concepts in detail? Um, that's a great question, and I think that the answer is subjective. So I'm going to give you my perspective on this. I don't draw uh, a, a, you know, a, a big kind of differentiating line between employer brand and talent brand. Um, often I'll even use them interchangeably. Um, I'm absolutely not saying that that's the answer. Uh, there's people who will tell me that I'm completely wrong and they're very distinct things and this is why. That's fine. That's just not my view. For me personally, uh, I interchange them. I, I, I think that they can, you know, I, could, I see the logic for people that do define them in different ways. Um, so, you know, I get that uh, and, and I could probably be persuaded if somebody sat down and, 
you know, bought me a, a coffee or several beers and tried to make the case. But for me personally, uh, I view them as, uh, as kind of interchangeable. Um, I tend to use employer brand more than talent brand, um, but uh, I, I, you know, I, I don't see, personally, I don't see a big distinction between them in terms of how I use the language. Um, all right, so we've got, uh, if we have more questions, uh, go ahead and jump in with comments. Um, while I'm waiting for those, uh, and if we don't have any, that's cool too. I wanna just come back to that one point around marketing because I think that, that is, um, that's really important. If you're developing an employer brand kind of strategy or presence within your organization for, organization for the first time, it's a complicated thing to do, especially if it's never existed within your company because you're having to make the case of it oftentimes within recruiting, you're having to make the case for it within the broader HR function, and then you're having to make the case for it within the broader organization, which usually gets zeroed in on marketing. So there's a ton of case studies and information you can easily find uh, on platforms. I mean, Googling will get you a lot of stuff. HR Open Source has a lot of stuff. Um, Google Rework Platform has a lot of stuff. Uh, Hung Lee has a newsletter called Recruiting Brain Food that, uh, you know, while it's definitely not employer brand specific, it's got tons of great information and every week he sends it out. It's a push of uh, a broad range of information. So definitely subscribe to that because that's gonna have some information that'll be helpful for you coming into your inbox. Um, but I would really, you know, kind of browse all of those things and build a case that actually isn't anecdotal. You're able to actually bring with you research, statistics, case studies, um, things like that that can really help you make the case as to how an employer brand presence and strategy is going to benefit your organization. I think the other piece that you need to think about when you're designing that is if you rewind a couple years back to the early days of employer brand, Employer brand at that point, you know, this is probably around the mid, you know, 2010, you know, 2012, 2013 range. It was all about talent attraction, right? So we were all trying to sell how cool our companies were. Um, we were, you know, doing, you know, canned videos of ping pong tables and, uh, you know, happy hours and all kinds of nonsense that we thought employees uh, really wanted. And the reality at that time, because employer branding was still fairly uh, immature, this version of employer branding was, uh, it worked, right? People were attracted to that. People were attracted to the slide you had in the office and the ball pit and, uh, you know, the, the, you know, Freaky Fridays, whatever crazy programs you had in your organization. And so people were like, ooh, I want to have Freaky Friday. You know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to apply to this job. And what happened is you started overwhelming the recruiting funnel. Um, you had all these candidates that, uh, you know, if they really would have known more about your organization, they probably wouldn't have applied. But because all you did was sell the sizzle, that sizzle connected with them and they applied. And so recruiting teams got overwhelmed, uh, volume of applicants increased, candidate experience decreased because there's no way you're going to provide high levels of candidate experience to that volume of applicants. And, uh, and it kind of became a disaster. And I think the, the interesting thing is that the, the field of employer brand at large has actually reset itself a little bit and kind of realized, you know what, um, yeah, obviously we want to find out what are the, the key elements of our organization that will attract candidates and we do want to lean into those. Um, but we, we don't want to just do that. We want to really be a bit more balanced. We want to say, hey, you know what, uh, we have an open office environment. You know, you're not going to, you're going to be sharing a desk with three people. Uh, we don't have work from home. Um, you know, there's tons of dogs in the office. Maybe you're allergic to dogs, right? So providing a real more open and authentic view of both the, the pros and the cons of the work experience. And what you're doing with that is, you know, you're both attracting and repelling. People that are drawn to that are going to be like, yeah, I'm in, sign me up. I want to, I want to pursue this. People that, uh, that are not into that, they're going to be like, yeah, not for me. That's a, that's a pass. Both of those outcomes are great. You, you don't want people that based on a, a real, you know, authentic view of your organization, um, don't align with that. You don't want them applying. You want to be able to arm them with the information they need to make that educated decision uh, and decide whether they want to apply or not based on that. So again, just an observation of how the field of employer brand has evolved um, over the last really, you know, five years. Um, I'm going to jump back in one more time just to see if we have any more questions before we wrap this up. Uh, let's see. Which companies do you think are the best in employer brand? Can you give us some examples? Um, yeah, great question. There's so much great work being done right now. It's hard to, to kind of hone in on just one. I think for me, 
Um, the one brand, uh, and I don't know, I think they're actually a little bit less active than they were, um, but L'Oreal uh, as a brand uh, out of Paris was just, just phenomenal. I mean, they were doing shit that nobody else was doing. Uh, unbelievable creative they had uh, I, I jokingly refer to them but I wasn't even jokingly it's more jealousy driven this is the Willy Wonka of employer branding um, they did all kinds of stuff you know they did uh, you know this this emoji based um, sentiment score to identify pockets of talent in new countries um, they had a uh, they did just have videographers within the employer brand team uh, they had basically a production team they had videographers they had animators um, they had, you know, audio engineers. They they were able to to build and create such compelling and original and unique content that uh, you know to me. And again, I think that they're you know they're doing a little bit less of that, but uh, that's still the the brand. That's still the company. Those are still the examples that uh, when I think about you know who is just kind of setting the bar. Uh, it, it, it's L'Oreal, so uh, a huge fan of their work, and um, and yeah, I think that there there's so much because the employer brand, the field is is matured the way it has. There's so many great examples. I think what's tough now in employer brand is because many more companies are actually investing in it. You have many more teams, uh, and some that are again very sophisticated, where they have basically production teams in house. Um, the bar just keeps getting raised, and while that's you know great in general, especially if you have the resources to do that. Uh, I think that there's, I've always come from the scrappy side. I've usually worked in, you know, startups and SMBs and even, you know, nonprofit and NPR is kind of where I cut my teeth in employer branding. Um, I had no budget. I had to be, you know, MacGyver out there figuring out how to tell stories and how to connect with new audiences. And so there's a certain scrappiness that I find that uh, the lack of resources actually inspires. And I, I love seeing examples of that. I love seeing companies that are uh, pushing the boundaries and really doing innovative stuff that I know uh, have you know next to no budget, uh, and it's just a person with an idea uh, and, and a willingness to take chances and uh, calculated risks and, and seeing what they produce. So um, that's that's the underdog in me. I love seeing that kind of uh, that kind of effort and that kind of outcome. But uh, again, I think uh, L'Oreal would be a, a brand that I would certainly look to a lot of their work. Um, so I think uh, we're nearing the end of this live broadcast. Um, I really appreciate all of you that have taken some time out of your day to join me uh, on the show. Uh, if you have questions or comments I didn't get to, um, hit me up anytime. Obviously, you're on LinkedIn, so you can directly message me on LinkedIn. You can leave a comment on this post. Uh, I'll come back to it and find it, and, uh, and I'll keep you posted. One of my aims, and actually, this is one of the things I'd love to get your feedback on, is um, I talked to LinkedIn about potentially doing a live weekly uh, broadcast much like this, but have a, a set cadence. So uh, every Wednesday at two o'clock, whatever the day and time would be, uh, you know, I'll come on and uh, and do a live, you know, AMA or discussion around a topic and or interviews. Um, I get you know get a chance to go to a lot of different events. So when I'm there, I can do live interviews with some of the attendees and um, folks that you've seen uh, in this stream. So. Anyway, we'd love to get your thoughts on that. Um, so maybe that's my one ask to all of you before I wrap up this podcast. If you think that would be interesting or useful or you would watch that, uh, you know, let me know. Feel free to let me know in the comments here. Or just hit me up at the PM. Uh, but yeah, curious, uh, b before I commit to that kind of a schedule, I want to know if, if that's actually something that uh, there would be interest in. So yeah, if so, let me know. And uh, in the meantime, keep the comments coming. Keep engaging with each other in the thread as well if you have ideas or suggestions based on comments other people have raised. And uh, thanks for tuning in. And we will see you back on the next show.